Um, and uh, I was asked to uh, talk about the climate in 2053 because you have uh, the interest, focus your interest on that, uh, on that time period. And I will try to, to answer your, your question. Um, but a uh, key point I will make is that the climate of 2053 is not a fatality. It's, it's something that, is, that will be the result of choices that, will be, uh, that we will make or not make in the coming years and, and decades. So I'd like to talk today about climate change, say a few words about IPCC, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is that UN body I am associated with. And I'd like to um, cover the spectrum of the uh, last IPCC report um, from the climate science aspect to the impacts and also to the uh, <coughs> mitigation of climate through uh, the reduction of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. But first, and sorry, some of my slides are in French, but what matters is the, um, the, uh, the graphics, of course. Um, is climate warming? Well, climate is uh, the average over a 30-year period, so we should not um, conclude about the global climate uh, as some would like to do sometimes on the basis of uh, last, week's, uh, last week's temperature in Belgium or in the UK. Of course, uh, that's um, almost irrelevant to um, the, the, the climate question. I mean, the same last week, Probably very few people know in Belgium that it was 47 degrees C in India. And hundreds of people were fighting with electricity producers who had cut electricity to air conditioners to uh, try to have some energy back so that they could uh, feed their, their air conditioners, at least those who, who, who could afford them. So climate is really a global question and also needs to be uh, seen with some uh, time perspective. And what you see here is over the last um, 40 years or so, the uh, annual temperature. Uh, and of course it fluctuates from, from one year to the next. But if you compute the averages, 10 year by 10 year, which is what is done with those uh, purple horizontal line, you see that each 10 year period is actually 0.15 degree C warmer than the preceding one, which is almost exactly what, what, the, what the IPCC projected 30 years ago, almost 30 years ago, 20 years ago, let's say, um, in its um, climate projection, saying that uh, climate would warm over the coming few decades by between 0.1 and 0.2 degree C per decade. Well, 0.15 is right in the middle. So, Climate is warming, not only over the past 40 years, but uh, if you look at the, hundreds, the last 150 years, you see that the temperature has overall been increasing. That's the top diagram. Of course, with fluctuations, climate, again, must be seen with some perspective. But you have plenty of other indicators that climate is really being uh, affected and changing, affected by something, some factor, and we'll see later which one. Is, has become the most important. You see in the middle diagram that uh, sea level uh, is increasing as well, um, approximately 15 centimeters over the last 100 years. And another example, another indicator, is the snow cover uh, in the northern hemisphere has decreased over the last 40 years by several million square kilometers. Glaciers are receding. Look at this glacier in Peru in 1978 and from the same point the way it looked 25 years later. This is the behavior of more than 80% of the uh, glaciers in the world today and this is also a result of warming. Look at the Arctic ice cap, the uh, sea ice, the thin layer of, fro of uh, frozen sea water that covers part of the Arctic how it looked at the beginning of the satellite observations in 1979. Uh, uh, the last um, minimum records uh, observed in September 2007. 
and this record, uh, minimum record, has been broken last September when uh, on 16, the 16th of September, uh, the uh, area was uh, about uh, one, approximately one million square me kilometer lower than the preceding reco record, which I just shown you, the 2007 one. And of course, this is changing not only uh, climate, but also the navigability of the, the region, which is uh, will have probably some uh, interesting political consequences over the coming decades. Precipitation has also been um, uh, affected. You see uh, here statistics from a few example points in the end in the world. All those points have seen increases in precipitation over the last hundred years. All these regions have seen decreases in precipitation. So let's turn a little bit on, 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 on the physics of the climate system, which is changing, and we'd like to know why. If we didn't have the so-called greenhouse gases, this is how the energy would uh, flow. Uh, in simplified terms, with solar energy in yellow and infrared heat emitted by the surface shown in red. And if we only had those, uh, the, the balance between the in, incoming radiation and the outgoing radiation would lead to a temperature, a surface temperature, that would be uh, much colder than what we have today, minus 18, and probably life on Earth uh, would not have evolved the same way. So we should be very thankful that there are greenhouse gases, the main one, the main natural one being uh, water vapor, of course, but uh, a very important greenhouse gas uh, is CO2. It's a natural greenhouse gas and it's also more and more a human greenhouse gas. And those greenhouse gases have the property, as you see here, to trap a, a large proportion of the infrared radiation and to re-emit it mostly towards the surface. And the balance, the new energy balance with those greenhouse gases is plus 15, which is the average temperature of the, uh, of the planet. Um, so it's very good to have uh, the greenhouse effect. The problem is uh, if we have too much um, if we have too much of something good, it can become uh, poison, as you, as you know. And the problem is that we are burning fossil fuels uh, to um, a large, uh, very large scale. Uh, each um, gigajoule, it's a unit of energy produced through coal, produces about two times um, more kilograms of CO2 than natural gas. Uh, to give you an idea of the difference between the different um, fossil fuels. But the result of all that, all that combustion is that the CO2 concentration, the percentage in the atmosphere, has been slowly increasing. Uh, and you have heard probably uh, a few over the last few weeks that we have uh, at least briefly uh, been crossing the 400 ppm threshold, which is, uh, of course, symbolic. Uh, but uh, which is a value which has never been seen uh, for um, more than probably two or maybe three million years in the history of the Earth. We have now data uh, for the last 800,000 um, years for the CO2 concentration. I only, only show half of that here. And you see that over that period, the values have uh, oscillated between 180 approximately and 280 ppm, ppm is par per million. Uh, remember, we are close to 400 now. And never, uh, it, went, it never went above 300, let's say, um, during that pre-industrial period uh, when only natural factors were acting. And this is the evolution over the last 100 years. Now, why is that uh, changing? Well, because we have perturbed a balance which, was, which had been very delicately maintained, at least as it was before the pre-industrial period, before 1870, 1850 approximately, 
uh, for the last 10,000 years. For the last 10,000 years, we had approximately these numbers. Very important fluxes from vegetation and soils of the order of 120 gigatons per, of carbon per year, but also absorption of about the same quantity through photosynthesis. The same for oceans, emissions uh, in the warm part of the oceans of a little more than 70 gigatons, absorption in the polar regions and the colder part uh, for the most um, part uh, of approximately the same quantity. Actually, if you add up what is going up and compare that to the addition of what's going down, it's exactly the same number, 190. And even if the fluxes were very important, uh, as they were balanced, the quantity of carbon in the atmosphere, 600 billion tons of carbon, remained stable for the last 10,000 years. What we have done uh, by burning fossil fuel is to um, perturb uh, that balance, that equilibrium. Uh, and these were the numbers for the uh, last decade of the 20th century, for which the uh, carbon cycle is well understood. So we were, at that time, emitting approximately, approximately a total of 8 gigatons, 8 billion tons of carbon every year, mostly through the burning of fossil fuels, but also in part through deforestation. And the natural systems were absorbing a little over one half of our emissions. They were recycling for us. Um, part of our emissions, but what was not recycled by natural systems was not recycled by us either, because we just send that CO2 in the atmosphere without caring uh, about what's, what happened next. So, every year, the thickness of greenhouse, gas, um, of greenhouse gases increases uh, by and these were the number at the end of the 20th century, per a little more than 3 billion tons of carbon every year. So the thickness of that blanket, which is trapping heat close to the surface of the Earth, is increasing. And we are facing a, a stock pollution problem, where, where you have a stock of pollution which slowly increases. And it's a different, that's very different from a flow pollution problem, such as noise, for example, when you have a noise pollution problem, if you interrupt the, uh, the source of the noise, uh, you immediately have an end to the pollution. It's not the case here, because we are accumulating that CO2, which remains in the atmosphere for centuries. Now, I've spent, now that I've spent a little time to explain those numbers, you can understand that uh, someone who would compare the human emissions and the natural emissions, saying and observing, which is something which is true, that human emissions are much smaller, approximately 20 times smaller than natural emissions, and use that argument to suggest that human emissions don't really matter, and, and therefore you don't need to uh, do anything about them, is actually quite dishonest because there's a big difference because those big natural emissions and the human emissions is that the natural emissions are balanced and ours aren't. So that's just an example of uh, a typical argument that you now have the tools to uh, dismount yourself that is used by some climate skeptics because as you know there are merchants of doubt uh, and this is the title of, uh, of a book uh, written by uh, two historians of science, Naomi Oreskes and Eric Connolly from the University of San Diego, if you're interested, um, to uh, look at the, uh, the details on, on how this is uh, organized. And you sometimes hear about them in Europe as well. So how does the IPCC work? Well, the IPCC was created exactly to have uh, the best uh, science advice um, at the disposal of policy makers so that they, not, that they, they can know what the, uh, the, the right answer is to those uh, 
uh, bogus arguments coming from climate skeptics and some uh, special interests from time to time. So it was established by the World Meteorological Organization and the United Nations Environment Programme just 25 years ago to provide policymakers with the best um, uh, and the most objective source of information about the entire dimensions of uh, uh, climate change issues. And the next report is in preparation. The first volume on climate science will be published in September this year. The second volume on impacts in March next year. And the third volume on mitigation in April next year with a synthesis report coming in October 2014. Uh, and that will feed into the preparation of the next um, international treaty on climate change, which, if everything goes well, should be adopted in Paris in, uh, at the end of 2015. You can find a lot of uh, the IPCC information and uh, all the reports uh, published by the IPCC on that uh, website. Um, a key characteristic of IPCC reports uh, is that they have to be policy relevant, but not policy prescriptive. Of course, we don't want to uh, replace policy makers. We just want to serve them with the best uh, information, provide them with options. There are three working groups, and we will look at information coming from these three working groups one by one uh, in the coming um, minutes. Uh, the uh, last report to give you um, uh, an example of the, uh, the number of people involved, uh, involved uh, more than 450 uh, lead authors uh, from um, uh, 130 countries. Uh, there were 800 um, secondary authors, uh, 2,500 scientific reviewers, 90,000 comments coming from experts and governments in the process through three complete cycles of review and rewriting. So at the end you have information that is quite solid and that is hard to, um, uh, to disprove. Working Group 1 on climate science, um, well I will illustrate some aspects of its report. Um, um, a lot of the um, projections and the analyses are now based on climate models. I know you've been talking about computers in the previous session, of course. Climate modelers are big users of uh, computer models uh, of the climate system, which decompose uh, each um, part of the atmosphere, oceans, cryosphere, the, the ice um, component of the system, etc. Uh, and try to reproduce its behavior on the basis of um, natural laws. And this allows you to make experiments you cannot do in the reality on the climate system. For example, you can try to uh, see over the last 150 years, uh, as shown here, the separate effects of different factors influencing climate. The red curve is coming from the effect of greenhouse gases, not only CO2, but also the other greenhouse gases, such as methane, for example. Uh, the yellow curve is the effect of solar radiation, the small fluctuation in the energy coming from the sun. The pink horizontal curve is the zero effect coming at this time scale from the changes in the shape of the uh, orbit of the Earth, the Milankovic effect. The green curve shows the effect of volcanic eruptions, which blocks some of the sunlight when they take place and have a cooling effect, as you can see. And the blue curve shows the effect of uh, the uh, pollution, by the classic pollution by sulfur, uh, which has a cooling effect because it also blocks a little bit like the, volcano, um, the volcanic emissions, some of the uh, solar um, energy. When you combine all of those, you have the red curve, which reproduces, not too, it's not too bad, the observed temperature, which is the black curve. So this is the kind of uh, um, simulations the, the, which is done to try to see which factors are the most important. This is not a way to present the same, same kind of idea. In these simulations, the um, natural factors, solar, um, activity and volcanic eruptions uh, have been regrouped and the result of those simulations uh, are shown in blue. The temperature, the observed temperature is the black curve 
and the top um, simulations in red uh, are obtained with all factors, human and natural, and as you can see, over the last 50 years or so, there is basically no way to reproduce properly the observed temperature only with natural factors. It doesn't mean natural factors don't play a role anymore, of course they do, but human factors have become dominant. And this is why the IPCC has concluded in its last report that not only warming was unequivocal, but also that most of the warming of the past 50 years was very likely, which means a probability above 90%, due to increases in greenhouse gases of human origin. Now, having tried to reproduce the uh, climate of the past, we can look at the uh, climate of the future. Now, we cannot predict the climate of the future, because to do that, we would have to be able to predict on which emission curve we will be over the next 100 years. Will we be on this relatively low scenario, or will we be on this relatively high scenario? And the results at the end of the century are not the same. Now, sorry, you have, you have another source of uncertainty here for each scenario, and you have the six results here corresponding to the six scenarios here, which is coming from the scientific uncertainty and that are still present in the modeling itself. I mean, the climate models are not perfect, and for a given scenario, we still have some uncertainty, which is shown by those ranges here. So at the end of the century, uh, if we were on this scenario, we would, we would be uh, between 1.1 and 2.9, and if we were on this high emission scenario for CO2, we would be between this value, which is uh, 2.4 and 6.4. So the uh, two extremes are 1.1 with the lowest scenario, the, less, the least sensitive model, and 6.4 above the temperature of the 20th century um, with the highest scenario and the most sensitive model. Now, the question. What is the climate is 2053? Well, I'm sorry, I gave a lecture a few weeks ago, uh, not very far from here, on the other side of the linguistic border, and they were interested in 2063. I mean, it's only 10 years later, so I thought, well, maybe I'll show, I can show you this. <laughs> it's not going to be that different. From um, a, a, a range of the range of scenario which uh, was shown, which which was shown by the IPCC report, you see that uh, it would be in 2063, and it would be maybe a little less in 2053, uh, between 1.1 and 2.5 degrees C at the global scale. I mean, it gives you an idea, um, uh, and this is um, above the temperature of uh, the last 20 years of the 20th century. You might think, sorry, you might think, oh, a few degrees by the end of uh, the next, the, uh, the end of this century, or by the middle of this century, it's not a big deal. Well, maybe if you look at this, you might change your mind, because if you look at the temperature evolution over the last 10,000 years, you see how stable it has been, plus or minus one degree, let's use wrong number. 10,000 years, that's the uh, period during which civilizations have developed. And 20,000 years ago, the Earth looked like this, with three kilometers of ice above North America and on Northern Europe. Three kilometers of ice, I'm talking about the thickness, okay? The uh, sea level was 80 meters lower than uh, today because of that. There was so much water stored on the continents that there was less water in the oceans. The temperature difference between this situation 20,000 years ago and the present situation today is of the order of four or five degrees globally. So let's go back to that diagram uh, and observe that this warming of four to five degrees took 3,000 years approximately. And we're talking about having possibly something of 
the same order in less than 100 years, 30 times faster and for the same order of magnitude and this would be uh, easy to go through? Well, maybe it's not so sure. If you stand back a little more and look at the last 1200 years, you see how different the climate were. I mean, these are the same, same values as before, even if the colors are different, it's the same range. Uh, you see how different the climate towards which we are moving different is from uh, the, the climate of the last 1200 years. Of course, it's not only temperature, it's also precipitation which changes. For example, this is December, January, February, this is June, July, August. You see uh, all, what, what is bluer becomes, uh, is wetter, what is uh, redder uh, or yellow is uh, drier, and what is white, we don't know, we're not sure. But uh, it means in winter, more water or more snow, if it's cold enough to have snow. So some people believe that if we have more snow in winter, it means we don't have global warming. They are wrong. They have not understood that when climate warms, you have more water vapor in the atmosphere, and if the conditions are there to have rain or snow, well, you'll have more rain or more snow. And in summer, you'll see, for example, the entire uh, Mediterranean basin, which dries significantly, so the southern, uh, the southern part of Europe, northern part of Africa. It's also the uh, changes in the probability of extreme events. And I'm afraid I'm losing track of time. How much time am I left? I have to, I have to conclude. Actually, I've, I've, I've answered your question. I mean, what will be the questions in 2053? So let me, can I have one minute to, to, to conclude? So it's not only um, changes in, in the means, it's also changes in the extreme values. I mean, more heat waves, more droughts, more intense precipitation. Uh, it's uh, in the long term changes in uh, sea level due to the melting of uh, ice sheets. I'm not going to cover uh, volume two. I think you know, the impact of climate change is something you can uh, study by yourself, learn about by yourself in a much easier way than the physics of, of climate and the way um, climate is influenced by different factors. I think it's more important to spend time on explaining the climate science than just describe the impacts. I mean, everybody knows that heat waves are bad for health and that uh, intense precipitation produces uh, more uh, floods, for example. You don't need uh, to spend much time on that. And I'm not going to talk about the solutions uh, today, but maybe we can talk about that during the debate. So, I will jump uh, on, the, um, uh, on, the, on the last slide. Uh, if you want to, do, to know more, there are a few links here. And you can also go to uh, your um, local paper, Berlang van Limburg, one this weekend, where I had a tribune with uh, um, a colleague from the uh, Federal Environment uh, Ministry. Thank you for your attention.